All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, hope everybody's had a great summer, and um, hopefully some of you still have some plans to, to enjoy the, what's left of it. Um, I know kids are all starting to head back to school, so it's just getting to be that time of year. But I um, want to thank you guys again for taking some time out today to um, participate in this webinar with us. We've got a great crowd and a really good topic. Um, so um, today we're happy to have Klaus Blake from the University of Tennessee, um, specifically their Reliability and Maintainability Center. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about what um, our technology readiness plan should be. Um, with all the, the changes that are coming and, and all the um, improvements to technology, um, he's going to walk us through, you know, how we can best make plans to make use of those um, new uh, technologies and also, um, you know, bring along what we've already, our existing plan programs as well, rather. Um, so before we turn things over to Klaus, um, I always just have a few housekeeping items. So one, um, Klaus has been generous and has allowed us to record this session. So um, if you have to hop off early or if you have a colleague who, who you think really should hear this message, um, we'll have it up on our website uh, hopefully later today, if not tomorrow. So um, that'll be available for, for folks to view. Um, and then we, of course, always welcome questions. Um, you know, hard to make this too interactive since we're all spread out throughout the, the country and um, whatnot. But uh, if you do have questions for Klaus, uh, feel free to type those into the little questions box. I'll be monitoring those as, as he goes through his presentation and um, we'll, we'll toss them to Klaus as it makes sense throughout the presentation and of course have some time at the end as well. Um, I also always like to remind everybody that we are doing this live, so we're all here together. Um, so with that comes, you know, the potential risk of some internet issues or audio issues. So, you know, we'll, we'll try and resolve those just as quickly as we can, but uh, just uh, afford us some patience um, if, if we do run into any of those uh, issues. So with that, I am going to turn the screen over to Klaus and let him take it away. So Klaus, we're not, there you go. We see your screen. I'm not hearing you though. So if you were talking. No, no, I didn't say anything yet. I was, mm -hmm. I was going to oh, okay. see the screen. That's it. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, right? How does that work? Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. You're, you're good to go. Okay, great. Uh, first, uh, you know, thanks everybody uh, out there for listening in. Uh, today I'm going to discuss, you know, what should your technology readiness plan be? And, and, uh, and, and also a little bit about you know, you know, maybe we'll do a little bit of nostalgic things, uh, but also look at what am I seeing out there and, and really where the opportunities are for, for a lot of people, whether you're selling product on technologies or whether you're implementing. There's still a lot of challenges out there. And, and uh, I mean, when, when you think about this, uh, it was just, uh, just go back 40, 50 years and where it's gone and the pace that it's actually changing. You know, it, it wasn't that long ago that uh, you know you had to go uh, you know put these cards together and get holes punched or punching yourself and, and any, any millennial listening in is going to say what you know they'll be in disbelief that that people actually did this to, to work on a computer but that was within 40 50 years ago that was you know you, you put the stuff you know through the magic box and a lot of times you couldn't even touch the computer because it was so new and, and you know hopefully the program ran right you might just punch one right card wrong and you had problems you know and then, uh, you know, baby boomers are going to remember a slide rule, also called a slipstick. You know, basically for younger folks out there, that was our mechanical analog computer back then. You know, it just did multiplication, division, roots, logarithms, and, and, and actually, you know, did it work? Well, absolutely it did because they sent people to the moon using a slide rule. That's how it first worked, not, not by computer. You know, and, and you know, look at this and say, yes, phones were attached to cords at one point. You know, phone numbers started with letters. I think uh, our first phone in Michigan was uh, PR, was Prescott, PR. You know, then you had numbers. You know, calculators came out. You know, when I, when I was going to college, there was a debate my second year in college 
will you be allowed to use calculators? Is that considered fair during an exam? Now think about, about that with, within just less than a generation back. Recorders were big, awkward, functional. You know, uh, movie cameras about the same, you know, not always user friendly. The watches, I remember uh, during an MBA program at Michigan, part of the assignment was to get Switzerland out of, out of the watch industry, at least to help change it. That was actually an assignment. You look at what's going on now, uh, high end watches, yet they're still selling some, but watches have pretty much become a fashion statement. You know, with Swatch, and, and you uh, have a uh, you know, watch of every color to, to match an outfit that the ladies do and, and so on. So it's totally changed that business. Uh, you know, how many really still have an alarm clock? I remember pagers. You know, you, you'd get a page and, you know, it, it, it would uh, buzz you and vibrate, you know, and you go went to the next uh, pay phone to make an 800 number, number call back to work if they needed you. That that was not that long ago. You know, flashlights are bulky. You know, the, you know, the old ones with the big, deep batteries, and you know, everything's small and portable now. The old cameras are mostly digital. Digital, uh, you know, you know, but used, you know, and, excuse me, they weren't digital, but used, uh, you know, film. And so, outside of some high-end photography, most of the stuff's digital, and all this stuff, uh, you know, including a lot more. Uh, and, and now we're all tied to your phone. I mean, the grandkids, when you call them, they expect FaceTime. You know, you use a GPS for direction. Uh, you, there's apps when you walk into the big big uh, stores where it helps you find stuff in aisles if you use those apps, and, and it just goes on and on. When you look ahead at what's what's coming, you know, to some extent, what you can do is only limited by your imagination. You know, there's, there's some really good things happening. So the things are different now, and and I feel like you know you can do whatever you want given the time, resources, and money. I mean, you're looking at wireless sensors, the mobility technologies more user-friendly at the plant floor level, and, and really what you can do now is endless. If you go back to some of the beginning, back before the 1950s, you know, some of the older folks uh, might remember the, the uh, uh, Maytag repairman, and the old commercial was the old lonely or the lonely repairman. He was a something like the loneliest guy in town. And, and now if only he had something to do with his days and so on. And it wasn't that long ago, that that's all changed for us too. If you look on the bottom on the right hand side on that axis, as you go to the right, it's increasing capability with new tools and technologies. If you look on going up the left hand side, I call that increasing acceptance, usability, and return on investment. That's what are the capabilities and what are people actually using. You go back to those earlier days of 1950 or, and earlier, you know, most of that was really the fix it when it's broke time or the Maytag repairman, and, and like like most were you know before 1950. But then what happens about every 20, 30 years, and now it's happening more often, we hit what I call a zone of uncertainty, meaning well you know stuff's changing, but how much do I really want to change with it? Am I ready? Uh, how is it going to impact my business? How much is it going to cost me? Will the people accept the change? And then so, and it was really slow coming on first, but there was some computer usage and some, some shutdown of work planning. And that really went on for almost 20, 30 years. And there was not a real lot of big change, except maybe some select companies. And then we went into this other zone of uncertainty as a lot of this new stuff started coming out that we're, we're probably all more familiar with. You know, we started hearing words like design for, main, for maintainability there, there in the 80s. And by that I mean we you know we teach 33 modules of maintainability. But by that I mean is if if you've got a piece of equipment and you've got a part that you know breaks a lot and it's in the middle of that piece of equipment, it only costs about ten dollars. But you've got another part part that you have to take out in order to get to that cheap part that you break half the time, but maybe that part costs five hundred dollars. So why wasn't it designed to get the cheap part out and not interrupt or break the expensive part? That's just one of thirty some modules. Of design for maintainability as, as an example. Then you get to the uh, uh, all the acronyms that we're more used to: the uh, reliability-centered maintenance, the failure mode effects analysis, PM optimization, you know, root cause analysis. And, and originally, uh, those of you that were in FMEAs, they're really meant to be more of a design in tool uh, way back in the early days. But the way people are using uh, FMEAs attached with PM optimization, 
and lots of other information they're doing with it, you almost end up doing almost a full RCM, and, and they're calling it FMEAs. Uh, so uh, more to come on that. Uh, they're starting to stand better CMMS usage and analytics. And then also use of a lot of the predictive technologies was starting but not being applied as much as it really could or should be. And, and, and then the, the step towards, well, we really need to get to condition monitoring so we can do this while the equipment's running and also collect uh, uh, more live uh, real-time data. But what, but about that 2010, so we're getting a little closer to where we're at today, uh, all of a sudden, you had another zone of uncertainty. Well, I kind of get all this stuff, but it isn't fully implemented. Uh, for example, another study I did several years back said that it says that at best, this is on average, not every company, at best, any computer system, regardless of which one you use, big enterprise computer system around maintenance, the uh, total capability of that system is rarely ever more than 30% used. And most companies will come back and say, oh, yeah, we only use about 20%. That's kind of a shame with all the millions of dollars spent around CMMS systems. And, of course, a lot of companies are making money doing interfaces because the CMMS system doesn't get them exactly what they want. And on top of that, as, as, uh, with my ongoing benchmarking that I've been doing you know, for the last 25, 30 years, about 10, 9, 10 years ago, one of, the, one of the biggest comments or percentages of responses of, of several thousands was something like this that says, if we don't get better at culture, we won't be able to get to the bottom of the tough problems. And I'm starting to see those results, or I haven't for a while, seeing those results. I mean, the easy stuff that, we, that at least on average in North America, they've done that. And now all of a sudden, the improvement in reducing reactive maintenance is coming to a screeching halt. And, and that's a, that should be a a level of concern, at least on, on a bigger picture. And by that I mean, uh, as far as the survey, uh, what was done was uh, looked like this, and it was put into six uh, put into uh, six categories. Within each of those six categories, there's a bunch of bullets that says, "Here's what's going on and why." But as far as people and culture, 26% of North America said that if we don't work on culture. We're not going to get to the tough problems and really put processes in place to make this number one work and number two to sustain it if we're fortunate enough to get there. So, so again, we'll talk more about that and what I see happening in North America. On the left hand side is just percent reactive maintenance, and the bottom, obviously, just the years. Uh, my first big study uh, was ar around 1991. I was still in corporal role at that time. And the average reactive maintenance percent for North America was 54%. Then around 2007, 2008, I finished the next really big study. That was about the time I was starting uh, with the University of Tennessee. And that went down to about 34%. So a decent improvement. But then all of a sudden, uh, in, you, know, you know, looking at uh, uh, 2008 to 2015, and I should go back and explain, this study right here was done in the uh, 2008 time frame that gave us data that said things aren't going to get better. So that from 2008 to 2015, it only improved from about 34% to 31%. And then in the last uh, three years, you know, for 2018, I'm just getting ready to do a bigger study uh, to, to again recheck that. But essentially, as on average for North America, has not gotten any better. This was predicted 10 years ago if we don't fix culture. And as you see on my notes on the bottom there, uh, I've been in the several hundred plants in my time with the university and probably another 500 more before that doing corporate benchmarking and my, my time with General Motors. But it says here that as, as of the last uh, you know, five to 10 years when I've been traveling and, and going to plants with the university, that 70% of the plants visited feel that needing to prove culture is, is still a key or, or the most major issue to go forward. And the data is starting to show that. Now, these uh, these six slides I'm not going to go through uh, because uh, I think most of you have seen these. I mean, and actually, I like to say that you know you have to show them at least once because I don't think it counts as an R and M presentation if you have these slides in there somewhere. So, so I think you've all seen these uh, enough. But important is is just getting back to the percent age related. Percent random. 
you know, the, you know these original Nolan heat studies and the stuff uh, you know followed up and reported by John Mowbray in his RCM2 book, you know, says it was about 11 percent. You take all the four or five studies that were done, you know, that have been published around this, that age-related averages around 17 percent. You know, so I always like to say it's about 20 percent age-related, and so a 20 percent time base is probably the most you should have in that kind of maintenance. Uh, some of the studies I've done, I've seen more like 30, 35 percent um, random failure. So the numbers are a little higher, but but still mostly random failure. And, and I, I think as we go forward, uh, I should say a little more positively, I'm pretty sure as we go forward, we're going to find out that as we're collecting real-time data, we're all going to get smarter at, at finding out why and some of the root cause, and, and also I think predicting some of these failures. So I think with machine intelligence and, and probably eventually artificial intelligence, we'll find out that that, that random number or age-related uh, number is going to go higher. And I mean, it may not, you know, be the majority, but I, but I think it may get a lot higher than this. And you know, maybe it'll be 50-50. So again, that's that's just uh, an, an uh, assumption or statement on my part. I, I use this to to start out, and you'll see how it ties together in a minute. Uh, there was a movie by Robert Redford you know, quite a while back ago, Havana, and there was a quote in there that said, a butterfly can flutter its wings over a flower in China and cause a hurricane in the Caribbean. Now, uh, I almost said it, this went viral, but there was no going viral back then because nobody had all the computer links and all that. But essentially, it did go viral and then it was quoted for about five years after that, after this movie. But I'll, I'll have to uh, you know, throw some some comments on that saying that's really bad physics, that that can't happen. And so and so sorry for all those that used that quote back then. But but uh, what happened was that uh, there there was a, I'll call him a weatherman, but really, really he was a PhD, I believe, weatherman. It was uh, Ed Lorenz. And every time that he was trying to do modeling as to what was going to happen around the world, he would make minor changes and assumptions on the data. And because of that, those minor assumptions it would cause drastic changes in the complex systems that he was trying to model. And so every time he ran that model, he got a diff different path and direction. When you put all those together, it kind of looked like what's on the screen there, kind of like a butterfly. So that's why it was called the, the butterfly model or butterfly effect and where that quote came from and how it all tied together. Now, now if, if you watch the comedy show Big Bang Theory, uh, they mentioned chaos theory a lot. It was really this kind of uh, modeling and information that led to chaos theory. And you know, by the definition, uh, you know, chaos theory is simply the branch of math or mathematics that deals with complex systems whose behavior is highly sensitive to slight changes in the conditions. So just like he modeled some things and made slight changes, drastic results of, dif of differences on the back end. That's really what chaos theory does. So what in the heck does that have to do with maintenance and reliability? Because what we're going to talk about is what presumed little things in your maintenance department can have a butterfly effect on your organization. Now, does anybody in your organization take verbal job requests that should be formal work orders? I'm, I'm guessing that happens everywhere. The maintenance sometimes get to the job site and discover that operations won't allow the machine to stop. Does maintenance receive unclear maintenance task direction, so they improvise. They're going to get they're going to get the job done at least to the best that they can. They see most job prioritized as safety or high priority, just to get to the top of the list. And especially if you're not managing backlog and your backlog's high. Because I've gone to places uh, that have years of backlog, but they're pretty much done with us. They change your program. But if, if let's say you have 20 week backlog, what, you know, what you're really telling operations is that if you have another job that's not highest priority, even if it's important, I'll get to it right away in 20 weeks. So no wonder they try to go around the system and, and do what they have to do to try to get the job, job done. You skip less critical PM checks because they can't be finished in time or on a monthly schedule. And what I see more often than or not, when those are skipped, they're reported as completed, thus making the key performance indicators look good. Struggle, uh, people struggle to find the correct partner. 
because all the parts aren't common coded with a standardized system. And obviously that also affects reordering and procurement. Or if you are fortunate enough to get the parts that go out for maintenance, what happens when they're not used? Are they properly put back in the system? How does that impact return make men order systems? And, and we can go on and on. You learn only that's you learn that only some of the asset history is captured because work orders are not closed with enough detail or at all. By that I mean is, is you know, do you record time? Do you have the cost tied into that? Is the cost allocated to the right equipment? Or what's being done, or is it just put where you happen to have money that week or that month? Do your trades and technicians hoard parts? So they don't trust the stockroom data, or, or, or they can't get parts in time, and they don't want that to happen again because then they look at them why they're not doing their job. You don't perform root cause trending, root cause or trending or reliability growth tracking because you lack quality asset data. You see continuous backlog growth, assuming you're counting all work orders not performed, as we talked about a few minutes ago. You're unable to predict cost other than it continues to go up. You doubt the data validity or accuracy through KPI, although the KPIs look good for the most part, looking at the daily plant, plant for practices reinforces the plant floors this trust because they, they usually know what, how well it's working and it isn't. Uh, more often than not, you know, I will look at the data on a plant's wall. A lot of times it looks pretty good. Then I walk in the plant and I, and I look and just say, that, that can't be happening. You know, the, there's no way that the data on the wall matches the practices on the plant floor, which he tells me right away in about 10 minutes, it's, it's just cost cutting to get the numbers there. So how does this all tie together and where do you want to go with this? Uh, and I like to say transitioning to excellence, it's all related. Uh, when when uh, I did a lot of stuff earlier in my corporate career, it was uh, safety, people, quality, up time, throughput, and cost. And for safety, especially as you're more more reactive or highly reactive, there's a direct link between reducing reactive maintenance and improving your safety. I see that all the time. Uh, people, we already talked about uh, culture, the, the impact of culture already on what we're seeing in the last 10 years, and I'll put a chart on, up on that in, in a little bit also. But as far as people, you know, there's a really good measure on engagement other than People will look at, are you involved in continuous improvement teams or, or some kind of plan for engagement on team uh, team involvement on decision making? Hey, Klaus, so like sorry at, to yeah. interrupt. Um, your audio is getting a little crackly, and I don't know. I mean, I know you're doing this from a hotel, so it could just yeah, be. Yeah, I, I took it off. Does that help? Mm, we'll see. It's not terrible, but I just wanted to comment in case there was something you could do. <laughs> no, it's, it's totally cool with this one. I guess I, I mean, I could try to call back in, but I'm not sure what that will do. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. We'll just keep going. No one, no one else has said anything, but I just wanted to point it out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're good. Yeah, keep it, going. It, it, Journey it, on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. If it gets worse, let me know. And, and I'll try to call back in and see if that corrects it. Some of just depends on which I would tell it goes through, you know, so. So again, okay. uh, as far as uh, uh, yeah. as far as quality, uh, you know, you, you have less variability in the process as your as your reliability process improves. I've also found that you know, I'll go back to the people uh, for a few minutes. That if you can, on a voluntary basis, get at least three suggestions per employee implemented, usually I see about a third percent improvement in, in throughput availability. A lot of the right things happening on the floor. Uh, putting putting that in perspective, North America can't average one suggestion per employee on average. There's companies doing better, but generally it's about 0 0.5, 0 0.8. You can't even get one, and I see three as kind of the turning point uh, for companies that are hey, doing, well, doing really well. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. It it does seem to be um, 
getting worse. So maybe if you, we can just have a quick pause. If you want to just hang up and then dial back in, I think that might, um, maybe that'll solve it. Because it was fine there for a while. Okay, yeah, I was wondering why it's so silly. Let me make sure I have the numbers that I can to the room. It should, if you look at the, on the menu, the audio section, it should, it has the phone number there, so. Yeah, let me, let me, let me hang up on the back then. Okay. Okay, sorry, everybody. <laughs> like I said at the beginning, live, live TV, right? So hopefully when he dials back in, it'll be better. Uh, I'm still there? Yes. Okay. Well, let's see how this goes. Is this better? I think so, yeah. So carry on. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, everything sounds good on this end, so I can't tell when it's going bad or not. So, so. all right. So, uh, so we talked a little bit about safety. People, uh, you know, uh, again, three suggestions kind of I see as a sweet spot, three voluntary suggestions for employee. I'm seeing a lot of improvement. Uh, on throughput and, and behavior on the floor. Uh, quality, you can get less variability as your process uh, and reliability matures. And the, really the first big benefit that you usually see is an uptime in throughput and also inventory turns. And that's really where your biggest savings is going to come from. And obviously it impacts cost. You know, if, if your goal is just to reduce cost, well, we all know how to do that in maintenance. You just do less of it. And, and uh, but you can't cost save your way into best practices or you know or, or uh, performance and so on. So uh, so it sometimes you got to spend a little bit of money in maintenance to get that 10, 20, you know, 30 times savings or more uh, in, in availability and throughput. Going back to the chart of what was going on in, in that uh, uh, zone of uncertainty and so on. Uh, you know, the, the next piece uh, is only 10 years long. So, you, so this isn't to scale exactly, just how to fit the words in. But you're looking at uh, people now talking about and doing more precision maintenance and without getting a lot of detail through the right skills, technical competencies, and overall culture of, of proactive maintenance. Is, do you really know how to, how to disassemble and put it together? Do you really understand how to put a bearing in properly with, you know, without uh, getting it dirty and so on? Uh, we all know about the Internet of Things, big data, real time. You know, more comprehensive uh, uh, analytics, uh, you know, the wireless stuff in the cloud. And, and the more newer term you'll see out there, too, now is prescriptive maintenance. And that's basically preventive, you know, I, I'll call it preventive maintenance with built-in intelligence. So it's collecting data. And if you've got some algorithms or machine intelligence with that, it's now also generating work orders to actually go do the work. As it sees certain kind of data data coming in, so it's so it's really a live uh, uh, system as you go forward. Uh, augmented reality. I see a lot of people playing around with it. Uh, very few really really good applications, other other than people that are spending you know really really big bucks on it. Uh, so so uh, again, I think we'll see more in the future. But at least from my standpoint, I don't quite uh, see it there yet. You know, that's again those uh, superimposed uh, computer generated images. Uh, machine intelligence, I, I think we're seeing more and more of that, so I think more good things to come there. Uh, edge computing, uh, basically uh, uh, keeping all your calculations at a lower level cl uh, closer to the uh, function. And uh, you know, um, I, I was one of the uh, keynotes at the OSI Soft Conference uh, in April uh, earlier this year, and probably half the vendors out there were tied somewhere or, or tied into edge computing, so I think that that is the next wave, but not having to push all the data up to the cloud and so on, because even though it can be done, it's got it's still got limitations as to how much and how often you want to do that. And artificial intelligence, even though it's been touted a lot, um, my personal opinion is I don't think it's quite there yet for, for uh, prime time. And, and again, artificial intelligence, I would um, I, I would differentiate as it optimizes its own algorithms, uh, and, and but I don't see that uh, 
uh, there yet as much as I'd like it to. The biggest issue I still see is right now is data and integrity. Uh, working with companies on some things I'm doing on safety and reliability and other areas um, that some people all have to feel they have good data and they do, but then when we dig in there, they really don't have all of it. Uh, other people think they have all the data, but the quality is not there. So even some some big companies who think they have pretty decent data, the integrity is really not there to do things like machine intelligence and make some uh, prime time decisions on and so on. So the big lesson there is is you got to get your data in shape and you, know, you got to get some data integrity. And, and even if you don't have time to do all this all these high tech things that we're talking about, you got to clean up your data because when machine intelligence uh, and, and eventually AI becomes plug and play. If you don't have your data under control, you know, you're just farther behind. You know, and where do you go from there? So as you look ahead, you know, how is your company responding to over 75 million devices being connected to the Internet by, by 2025? You know, if you, you can look at that in terms of dollars. I mean, you know, whether you look at growth by dollars or number of, of items, uh, you know, even if they're, they're half right, it's just huge. Um, I do worry some about the uh, practical applications. The majority of companies are not really getting on board as, as fast as, as fast as they can. Because the majority of companies, when, when I say majority, I mean like 75% plus, are still saying all this stuff is great, or it sounds great anyway, but I'm really you know, you know, getting my job done at the end of the day, at the end of the week, and I'm struggling to get production out. So how, how do I even get into all these tools? You know, so so that, that is a concern that the pr practical applications aren't really keeping up with just the volumes of data coming in. A uh, quote from uh, one of the OSI soft guys, you know, there's gold in that machine data, but claiming it requires time, strategy, and expertise. Again, saying, if you don't clean up your data, it's not going to be worthwhile. And as as uh, Enrique here is saying, taking raw data from machines and shoving it into analytics doesn't work. You know, that, that's fool's gold. A, a similar thing, uh, the average percentage of assets with current asset information is most likely below 50% and really ex exceed 70%. And again, it's troublesome that most owner operators aren't able to identify their auto data information. So again, very quickly, it gets back back uh, to uh, data integrity. But meanwhile, all the data coming in doesn't stop. You, know, I just, you just gotta say, wow, you know, 90% of the data in the world has been created in the last two years. 90% of the data in the world has been created in the past two years. As you see there, it's uh, two and a half quintillion bytes per day. A quintillion is times 10 to the 18th. And uh, this was 2017 data, so I'm sure it's already way higher than that. The one that's kind of interesting, if you look way on the left-hand side, that 103,447, excuse me, 103,447,000 and some change, those are spam email emails sent every minute. So keep your eye on that one. According to the Data Never Sleeps report, in Snapchat chats, you can see there are half a million photos. This is every minute. More than 120 professionals join LinkedIn every minute. You know, over 4 million YouTube watches, you know, tweets, Instagrams, almost 50,000 uh, photos every minute. More than half of our web searches is now done with the mobile phone. And we said almost everything's done on the phone now. Also, more almost getting up to four billion humans use the internet, and Google processes on average more than forty thousand searches every second. That's three and a half billion searches every day. So, you look at the Internet of Things, and, and there's been a lot of publications on that, and and they're collecting all kinds of data, obviously. And you're saying here again, it's exploding from two billion to two hundred billion by 2020 from 2006. Now, some of these are forecasts. I'm not sure I believe all of them, but uh, according to Gardner, by 2020, what percent do you think of enterprise generated data will be created outside of the traditional centralized data or going up to the cloud? Because remember I said edge computing is really where people see a lot of this going. And you know, in, uh, in real edge computing uh, solution includes mach machine uh, learning and, and artificial intelligence and so on. And, and it's really, you know, they're seeing that by 2022, 75% of the stuff is going to be pushed elsewhere. It'll, it'll be on edge computing and other devices. Everything will not continue to go to the cloud as much just because there's a lot of time in, in, in with that also. 
we talk about edge computing and you know, some of the benefits. Again, you're at the source, real-time analytics, you know, lower data movement by, by factors of a thousand, ongoing machine learning. Obviously, a much smaller footprint. And better security, and there's other benefits, but those, those are some of the key ones. And people are using, combining a lot of te uh, technologies. And I just used this like one example uh, from uh, uh, Bentley Systems, you know, using uh, uh, drones to collect data to create 3D project models. So now they can take a look at, uh, you know, um, creating uh, all those tags, connecting databases. And now they can put together schematics and piping, instrumentation diagrams to reduce time for project and reduce a lot of the risk. Before you bury a lot of stuff, you know where all the utilities are. So just lots and lots of opportunities of combining technologies. And as I said at the beginning, it's, it's almost endless you know, based on your imagination. Um, it's not easy. I, I, I'm not sure how many companies have the stomach for doing a lot of these implementations early, and that's why I'm not seeing as much as, as it's being touted, because it does get expensive very quick. And as stated here by the McKinsey study, to really see a good payback, the survey suggests that it takes 15 or more tr IoT tries to have a modest payback. And so not, not many companies have the time or stomach for that, and so, you know, so a lot of them are sitting back and letting the big companies spend the money to develop the stuff. So it gets a little more uh, um, uh, pr say practicable and, and also uh, more affordable. So now we're back to uh, this chart, and uh, now it's 2019-2020, kind of where we're at. And again, a huge zone of uncertainty. We've talked about all these things coming. Some are proven, some aren't. Some people are testing them. You know, what, what's next beyond that, and, and, and where do we go? Uh, I, I put in, uh, this is, we just go out five years or more. I put in purchasing for reliability, maintainability. That, that's really a vision, a hope, or dream on my part, because I still see purchasing by and lowest cost in, in most cases, which is unfortunate. But again, you'll never get to life cycle costs for assets unless purchasing has a responsibility or gets measured on that. So I'm going to keep saying that, and hopefully uh, more companies will, will figure out how to do that. I think you're going to see uh, slowly, I think it's going to take uh, probably close to 10 years, but this is going to be, and that's a game changer, but a world changer, and, and that's quantum computing. And and uh, maybe the, the the best way to describe quantum computing, uh, everybody's familiar with with the current computing, uh, uh, with, with uh, um, traditional PC. Let's say does a calculation using bits, you know, with the zero being off and and uh, and the one being on, and so on. When you do quantum computing, uh, a quantum bit can be zero, one, or both simultaneously. And, and that's just simply called superposition. And so a traditional computer tries all the possibilities one by one. So, so that's not the most effective or efficient. And when you do quantum computing or have few computers that can do that, the superposition considers many possibilities at once and they converge on the correct answer. And so uh, some of the estimates and, and stuff that's been done already at, at, a, at a smaller scale between Google and NASA, the computers not will be a hundred or a thousand or a million times faster. They will be more than a hundred million times faster. That's that's a world changer on things that can be done. Now there are some tough limitations, you know, because of the physics of that happening, because of all all these uh, things working together and, and those um, bits they call qubits uh, for for um, quantum computing. The the uh, biggest uh, drawback right now or really what they got to figure out and get over is to control the physics of making that happen because right now the, the way they have to do that they have to do that almost at absolute absolute zero temperature that's kind of the you know the absolute zero um, uh, simply is the lowest temperature that, that's theoretically possible and that's uh, just below f minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit and, and so quantum computing works best because of the physics around it at those very low temperatures. So it makes quantum computing very limiting. So the challenge is, is how do they control that physics under more normal temperatures? But when that happens, that'll be a game changer, but I think that's uh, closer to over over five years away. So here we are, 2019. All this thing coming in, I, I think we're in a zone of uncertainty right now. 
with a lot of things changing very quickly, uh, people struggling, uh, and, and you know, so what do you do? And, and but things are going to keep changing. I mean, I mean, with the uh, Tesla stuff, that's already changed some stuff. If if you're working a, a car insurance business, I'm sure a lot of those people are looking around for other work in the in the very near future. You know, as everything gets more autonomous. Why do you need car insurance? Because you're not you're not responsible. It's tied to the people that are doing the program, and and so again, you got to look at you know how's your business going to be impacted. Uh, when you look at uh, just one, just pulled out a few examples. Uh, you know, I, I I already don't like driving next to uh, two trucks connected, let, let alone two or three connected. Now now here what's called platooning, and what that really means is some trucks may be connected, but let's say what they're pulling. But there may be a second truck behind the truck that's connected that's controlling the first truck. Uh, that's called platooning. And, and so they see some of that happening within the next couple of years. Uh, and then driver, then that's still a driver in both trucks that allows them to drive much closer together to save on the economy and kind of, you know, work the airflow around them and so on. But then by 2025 or in that range, they see the driver in only the lead truck. And then you go ahead and look at what's coming shortly after that. It's a driver for pickup and drop off, two or more trucks uh, platooning. So they're even seeing that as driverless, you know, probably just certain freeways up front. And then eventually, it's a driverless vehicle on highways and everything with two or more trucks. I mean, the, those are changers. Um, you see a lot of stuff on digital twins and IoT and so on. And, and to me, I think. Um, some of these are very optimistic. I, I've been to a lot of companies and a lot of places as to who's doing uh, virtual reality and what's working, what isn't. And, and everybody is really, uh, you know, except for very few uh, at, at the very, very basic level. And, and those that are doing it are some of the really big companies that, are, that can spend, you know, millions to invest in this because uh, they know it's coming. So, so, so kind of, in, in, you know, in summary, you know, you know get, get your data ready, number one. How do you get the integrity of the people? So most of the challenges aren't about the technologies. But when I look at North America, 75% of North America is not using enough prediction, predictive or condition-based monitoring. And, and that's, a, that's a real concern. Uh, on the bright side, uh, there's a lot of opportunity because of that. So you have to ask yourself, you know, why, why, are, why is 75% of North America not doing enough of it? It's not because the technologies don't work. It's the culture, the process, and everything around that that has to support it. And that's what has to really be fixed to, to make all this technology work. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop. I'll open up for any questions, Marine. Okay, great. Thanks, Quo. So um, one that had come through a little bit ago, um, they were wondering, how do we combat the data integrity issues where managers have buy-in that sounds great, but don't have the technical expertise to know that it's actually insufficient or subpar data. Well, well, I mean, they, they need to check their data. To see, I mean, they could take data from a small area, and I would just, you know, not try to do the whole plan, but pick one area and see how good that data is, how accurate is it. You know, does it reflect 100% of what's being done? Uh, you know, I, I'll just give it by example. I go into some places and they say they're doing 100% of their predictive technologies. And, and this is this is what's posted on the wall. And when I walk around, I say, can't be. And then I talk to the people that are doing it and I say, how, how many of your assets are covered with predictive technologies? They might say 20% because we don't have resources to do the other 80. But they forgot to tell the manager that part. The manager thinks he's getting it done all over. You know, he's, he's too busy and, and, and you know, he's not close to the processes on that if, if it's a huge facility or has multiple facilities. And so they've been reporting 100% predictive technologies performed without anybody asking the question, is it on all the assets that need predictive technology? So it's those kind of things that you know, there's that can be looked at. Are you doing predictive technologies or condition-based monitoring and all the assets you should be doing it at? Uh, and, then, and then as far as the data, just take one department. You know, on, on uh, even if it's just a piece of equipment, and say have all the costs been reported, is all the data collected? Uh, so you you can do a do a sampling and find out how good your data is. All right, that's it. And um, okay, cool. Um, all right, so how can you manage so much data, and is this going to create a new engineering job path in your 
opinion? Um, I'm going to say it might, and then go on to say it probably will. Uh, right now, there's over 100,000 openings for reliability, maintainability type people. The other shortage that I already see existing is data, what I'll call, you know, we call different things, but I'll just call them data engineers or data scientists that understand the kind of things I've been talking about in IoT, but also understand the processes on the plant floor so they can integrate. There's a phenomenal shortage of those people. And, and other people I talk to and say, well, we'll do more, but I can't find the right people to do this. They have, they have the combined skills to do that. So when you find even people trying to, let's say from consultants, uh, implementing virtual reality, you know, things like that for training twins and stuff like that, it isn't one or two people. It's usually a team of five or six because there's so many skill sets involved. And there isn't one person, there aren't many people that have all that knowledge together yet. I think that will be a future skill set. Okay, and the job, I mean, it's unbelievable, right, how many jobs there people are trying to hire for and not, not being able to find the right qualified folks, right? Huge yeah, opportunities of, for, of, for kids. We see that even, even in training. A lot of people are realizing, you know, they can get some people, but they're never going to get the people they need uh, to do this kind of work. And so they're, they're taking trades and, and uh, technicians and trades and engineers and, and we're seeing that more and doing, doing a lot more private classes and people coming to public classes realizing that they just can't find enough people fast enough. And, and even at, I can see that at the university, we used to have, you know, 40 or so, 50 students in a class. And now we have 170 in a waiting list, you know, just to get students into a class. And, and, and we're just touching the surface of what's needed, you know, to, to go through there. Yeah. yeah. So for those that are on here, if you're not familiar with um Society for Maintenance and Reliability Professionals, but their um, annual conference in October, a huge focus of a lot of the content and, and the closing panel discussion as well is going to be on kind of this workforce development and, you know, the the aging uh, workforce and things like that. So something to check out if, if it's uh, of interest to you and your organization, which it most likely is. Um, so Klaus, those were the questions that came through. So I'm just going to take the screen back here. I've got a couple closing slides. Um, but thank you so much. Great information as always. And, um, you know, folks, as I said, you know, we were recording this, so so we'll have this up online. Um, just a little yeah, yeah. plug from, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to break in. I, I don't know how the recording came out, you know, but if, but if, it's, if the recording is really tough to hear, I'm, I'm willing to do it over again on, online, you know, if there's a lot of people that couldn't make it. So I'm, I'm good doing that and we can figure that out. Okay, yeah, I'll take a listen to it. I mean, I think it's just that one little part, but but once you called back in, I think it, it all sorted itself out. So people should be able to work their way through that. Okay, but um, I appreciate uh, your generosity there, Klaus. So um, just, you know, real quick, shameless plug for, for UE Systems. Um, you know, again, speaking of training and education, we've got um, our summer sale going on for all of our online classes, so they cover um, all of the, the applications that you would use ultrasound for, which of course is important to us. Um, so mechanical inspections, compressed air surveys, uh, steam trap inspections, um, and uh, electrical inspections. And we also have a uh, lubrication best practices course as well. So something to look into, it's, these online classes are great, something you can take um, from the comfort of your office, your home, wherever, um, whenever. So. Um, if that's of interest, have a look. Aside from that, I'm going to leave our contact info up here for a little bit. If you have any questions at all, you can always reach out to me. Um, if you've got questions for Klaus, um, I'm happy to pass those along to him as well. Um, but again, appreciate everybody's time today. Appreciate you, Klaus, um, as always. And hope everybody has a great rest of their day, a great rest of their summer. And we'll look forward to seeing everybody hopefully somewhere along the line here real soon. But uh, with that, we'll say uh, farewell and we'll catch you guys later.